Welcome to Speaking of the Arts. I am Mike Epstein, and my guest today is the incredibly talented singer, songwriter, performer, and all around amazing artist, Cyrilla May. Cyrilla is preparing to release a new groundbreaking album called Beautiful Way. We talk about the making of this album, and you will get to hear samples of it throughout the episode. We also talk about Cyril's unique upbringing and what it was like to perform with gypsy musicians in France as a young child, and a whole lot more. Cyril has an amazing story, and I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. As always, thank you for listening. Hello, Cyril. Welcome Hello. to Speaking of the Arts. <laughs> I'm so glad you decided to take the time to talk to me today. Um, I'm really excited for our conversation. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. So let's just start kind of with a little bit of background. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about your uh, your upbringing and, you know, where you grew up and what are some of the earliest musical influences you can remember as a child that started to really tell you that this this life of music was something you had to do? Well, that's a lot of questions in one. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> I uh, I grew up in many different places. Uh, mostly, I I was born in France, and then two weeks later, we moved to Cameroon, Africa. So my very first memories were over there, and I really was brought up by my mom, who's from Dominican Republic. So, um my very first relationship to music was through dance because my mom is she just loves to dance and so she would put always salsa merengue bachata in the house for us to dance to my, my sister and i and so that was my first relationship to music for me music was made to dance and then when we were living in in france when i was little older um there we were living in this little village called Samoa, which is the village where Django Reinhardt used to live and where he's now buried and where there's now a Django Reinhardt festival in his honor. And it's a tiny little village, like 2000 people. But when the festival is on, it gets huge and gypsies from all across Europe come in their caravans by hundreds and they set camp in the field and they just play day and night to honor Django. Wow. And so when I was little, when I was like around 14, I became friends with them. And and I was really like the only one that was allowed on the campsite just because I was a kid, you know. And I was just in love with their way of life. You know, when you're 14 and you meet kids your age who who don't even know what homework is, you're fascinated. Yeah. So I was just hanging out with them all day and all night. And my parents were grounding me because all the townspeople were saying, we saw your daughter hanging out with the gypsies. You got to be careful. They're going to trade her for goats and whatever. And my parents didn't know whatever. They didn't know better, you know, so I was grounded. So then I had to escape from my bedroom window to cross my backyard, cross the forest and arrive at the, the campsite with the fire and everyone playing guitars. And then at some point, my parents realized there was nothing they could do. And so and so now they're like family and and um, and yeah. And so I started to I started to sing with them. And that, when I when you were around the age of 14. Yeah, well, first I became friends with this one guy. His name was Lumpy and he started to teach me guitar. OK. And I started to learn some songs on the guitar. Uh, but then one day his big brother was like, hey, can you sing this song? Because I know you you speak some English. And so I learned the song. It was called Sweet Sue. And there was one day where it was raining and we couldn't all fit in the caravan. So we went into this old abandoned bus that was parked there. And everyone was in there and you could hear the rain on the top of the bus. And the big brother, who was like the virtuoso guitarist of the family, asked me to sing the song. And I sang the song, every star above, sweet Sue, just you. And just the reaction of the people, like the smiles on the faces and just the connection was so much more direct when I was singing than when I was like looking at my fingers, trying to figure out guitar. I just 
from that moment, I wanted to sing more and more. And, and so I started learning all the songs that had lyrics from the Django records that I had, because that's all I knew really. And I reached a wall because there's not a lot, you know, it's not a lot of vocal stuff in the Django department. And then one day someone gave me a four CD box set of Ella Fitzgerald. And that was it. The rest is history. I was hooked and she taught me everything I know. How, I have a question. How long did you guys live in Africa? Because I, I wasn't aware that you lived in Africa. We lived in Africa for three, for a little over three years. So I was really a baby. Okay. So you moved back to France when you were about three? We moved to France for a year. Then we moved to America where my sister was born. Oh, wow. So yeah, we did a lot of yeah. By the time I was 20, I had lived in four continents. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, because I was curious um, when you were in Africa, I mean, I understand you were very, very, very young, but I'm just curious, was there, were you in a community where music was prevalent? And do you have any memory of that? I don't think so. But, you know, the first three years of your life are super formative, you know? Yep. And so I think what I stayed with that is definitely just the rhythm, just being my, my dad was working a lot and I was with my mom all day and my mom is Dominican and, and yeah. And there, there's, there was definitely drums around yeah. and I think the rhythm, the rhythm I've had from a very young age. And, and, and that's why I still like to groove, you know? So it sounds like a lot of parental influence musically came from your mother. Was your father, a uh, was he into music as well? Or was that mostly his, just on your mother's side? His biggest, wildest dream is was to be a musician, but he oh, can't okay. one note. He tried every instrument. And so that's another thing. There was a lot of instruments lying around in the house just because my dad was fascinated with instruments. He would go to garage sales and buy an old violin or or an old clarinet and then try to play it for like three weeks and just <laughs> totally failing and uh and so you know my sister and I we would take the instruments and sit on the sidewalk and pretend we're like street musicians and put out a little hat and, and ask for money and just be like bah, 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 bah. right you know just play around but you know we didn't know how to play the instruments but um they were instruments in the house it was like a sacred thing okay so it's safe to say that both sides were very musical and that was very influential in the household yeah they're musical in a very different way than being a musician you know sure. like my mom loved to dance and throw parties and my dad was fascinated with the idea of playing an instrument that makes sense when did you first start to actually identify as an artist that's a good question i I have no clue. I was just talking about that with a friend today. It's like, it kind of fell on me, you know? Like I said, when, when I first started singing and I just saw the smiles on people's faces, I was like, I want to do that more. I want to make people smile. Right. And so I kept singing and then I learned more songs so that I could sing more. And then I just kept doing it every chance I got. And then at some point, someone, some people started giving me money for it. And I was like, okay, cool, thanks. And and then I, you know, got more and more into into the repertoire and then deep into the 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 real book, you know, the American songbook. And so that's why I wanted to come to America. And before coming to America, I was living in Dominican Republic for a couple of years. And I started to really play, you know, there. I was I had a lot of gigs because I was also the only jazz singer on the island. Oh wow. <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I guess identifying as a musician, I never really thought I'm a musician starting now. You know, it kind of, right. the music kind of uh, took me on, you know? Well, it, she, it seems like you were performing from a very, very early age, whether it was for the uh, the folks in the gypsy camp that you talked about, or like, I, for example, I read that, you used to just sing on street corners when you were living in Europe. And it sounds like performance was just a constant, constant thing for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's just about having, you know, it's just 
at that age, it's it's not even you're not even thinking about it as a performance. You're just thinking right. of something you do with your friends that's fun. Right. You know that makes sense. Um. So one thing in your bio that I wanted to ask because I feel like it it um is worth having you tell the story, and I I'm very curious. So um, at one point you were selected, you were part of a group of finalists for Star Academy, which for people who don't know, that's basically the equivalent of, of American Idol in the US. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, at some point in that process, you realized the contract to be part of that was too prohibitive and you decided to not participate and you just walked away. What, what was so prohibitive about the contract and how did you know this just was not right for you? Well, I had a feeling because I was just starting to really get deep into the into jazz, you know, into improvised music and falling in love with with, you know, all the legends, you know, Miles and and Ahmad Jamal and Ella and everything. And. And before they gave us the contract, we were already on magazine covers and we shot a music video and we had to, you know, sing some things and they would never let me really pick what I was singing. They would be like, what do you want to sing? And I would say, well, I'd love to sing this. Oh, but we need something a little more like that. Okay, well, how about this? Yeah, but no. And so they would kind of gear me towards a song. And then when I got the the contract, I was like, wow, I haven't even signed this. And I'm, I already feel like I don't have creative choice. Yeah. you know create freedom so and so it. yeah so I, I studied I was 18 and it's really hard when you're 18 and you have fame staring you in the face to say no you know right. you know because like I said we were already on magazine covers you know we had makeup artists and it was like a dream come true and and I went over the contract a lot with my dad and and you know some lawyers and trying to really understand what it's about and and I realized I'm not that's not what I want I'm still a student and I just want to learn about this music that I'm totally falling in love with and this is not the way to do it and so I I left I I left the country I left France and I went to I moved to Dominican Republic where I had met a piano player who who had told me that if I wanted to, I could live with him and his wife and their daughters and just hang out and play music with him. And my parents at the time were living in Singapore, which is the other side of the planet. Wow. And so, yeah. And so I left. I went to DR. I, I left the show. They found my grandma's phone number over there and they started calling her saying, we want surreal. The show's about to start and we need her and we'll come get her on a jet plane or whatever. And yeah, it was super intense. Wow. And wow. Yeah, and I mean, I'm it's amazing. I mean, like but, most people would not have been able to say no in a situation yeah. like that. I mean, oh, it's, yeah. it's really definitely. admirable. It was definitely a tough decision at the time, but now when I look back, I'm like, oh, I'm so glad I didn't do it. So right. glad. Right. Oh, that's amazing. So, okay, so fast forward a few years, um, you would end up going on to win some of the biggest vocal competitions in the world. And I'm reading all this and I'm just wondering, was there anybody at any point, maybe even now, but I'm more curious in those earlier years, was there anybody that you would consider was a real mentor to you that, um, and if so, who was it and what did they, what did they guide you on? What did they teach you? I mean, I've had many mentors, you know, it's like you go through life and you meet people who push you in, in a certain way. And, um, I had mentors when I came, when I moved to Dominican Republic, Gustavo Rodriguez, he was a, a pianist that I was playing with and he was definitely a, a big mentor. He, he, him and I, we did duo gigs everywhere. And then, and then I started teaching in his school. He, he had a jazz school and uh, just teaching teaches you a lot, you know? Sure. And then I came to America and, and, uh, you know, uh, all my teachers at SUNY Purchase were, were mentors, but but also I uh, had this gig in the cupping room in Soho every Saturday for seven years. Oh, wow. Uh, a four-hour gig with just drums, bass, and voice. Drums, bass, and voice. No keyboard, yeah. no piano, no guitar, nothing. No harmony. 
So I had to freaking, I have, I had to be the harmony, which is why I got really good at scatting because it's, it was not even a listening room. It was a, a restaurant. So if you want to grab people's attention with only bass, it's really right. hard. Right. So you have in my souls, I had to really like outline the chord so that you could hear the color of the harmony. And so I got really good at, at that, you know? And so the drummer, that was his gig, Miles Stein. And he's the one that would hire me and a different bass player every Saturday. Wow. And oh, it, was, it was usually a different bass player? Yeah. A lot of times it was a different bass player. Was that tricky just because that didn't give the three of you a chance to have a rapport? How did you? It was actually fun because, you know, four hours is enough time to build a rapport. A long time. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so, you know, you, I got to really, uh, always be challenged, you know, to always have to be listening. I, I couldn't be like on autopilot and I got to meet incredible bass players, you know, like the, the best bass players came through the cupping room. Um, Tom Kennedy, um, Harvey S, um, Ben Williams, uh, Philip Keen, incredible bass players. And, wow. you know, bass and voice has been my thing since a long time. Every time I, I put out a record, there was always a bass and voice duo there. But yeah, Mal Stein was the drummer and he pushed me. He would be, at some point, he, he was like, okay, Cyril, introduce the next song. And I'd be like, what? No, I'm just here to sing. I didn't know how to speak to the audience. I would just let him do it because it was his gig. And then he forced me to speak. And then I went to Birdland and Johnny, Johnny was a great men mentor too, because he would be like, surreal, open your eyes and look at the audience and look to the right and look to the left of the people at the bar. And, and so little by little, you know, I started l learning like that and I was pushed in many, many ways. So why don't we just focus now and talk a little bit about this new recording you've been working on. Um, uh, just to kind of set it up for everybody who's listening. So for people who are familiar with Cyril's music, I think from the opening track, uh, Beautiful Way, it's very clear that this is a different journey um, musically for listeners, especially what they might be used to having heard you before. I think they're in for a real treat. It's it's different. Um, so can you describe, I mean, what was the process for making the recording and what, um, how did, you know, how did this all kind of come together? So this recording is a very, very, very personal very vulnerable very and so it ended up being very unique because it's really just me naked um and so and so this story is about to get really personal but i think it's part of the part of the message that i want to give through this music is to inspire to be vulnerable through through this through these songs um i started this album five years ago I started it, uh, I learned I was pregnant right before going to the jungle. Yeah, I told you it was going to get personal. Um, right before going to the jungle in Costa Rica. And so I was there for a week with life inside of me and feeling just really, really a lot of emotions and not knowing what to do. And, you know, I was in this very alive jungle, thriving nature and and I just wasn't ready I just really wasn't ready and so I came home and I had an abortion and I wrote this song about it inside and out that's the title track and that was the very first song that basically jump-started the project I can't believe I overlooked the signs was easier for me to close my eyes There is something growing in me Taking up a space inside me Still you make me see how love is blind Make no mistake I know this sounds crazy But in the end We'll meet again Even when the sun shines on me I got 
together with Jake Sherman, the producer in New York. And we recorded Inside and Out. We recorded Back to You. We recorded a few other songs. And then life happened and I moved to New Orleans. And so I aborted the project because I was no longer in New York. And also because I, at that moment, I didn't believe in myself as a songwriter. Right. I was, because I had built my career on singing mostly songs that have had the stamp of approval for decades. And it's just very difficult to, to have confidence in your own material, you know, uh, when you're starting. And I always wrote songs, but it was always like, okay, I'll put one original song in this record and one original song in that one. And And then I moved to New Orleans and I got deep into a Sondheim record, which will not help you in your confidence for your own songs. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, during these five years, I started going to the jungle more and more. In Costa Rica? And, yeah. And what I realized was that the jungle was super inspiring to me. What, what I need when I'm writing is to really hear what's in the deepest part of me. And when I'm in the city and when I'm distracted and when there's all the social media and everything, it's just a lot of noise. And when I get to the jungle, it takes four to five days for all this noise to die down. It takes a long time. And then finally the silence sets in. And then finally I can hear what's inside of me. And so I started going there and just writing. And I was very prolific and and so that's why I started to build a house there because I was like I want to share this experience to all my friends to with all my fellow musicians I want them to come and feel inspired the way I am and so I wanted to build a house so that it would be kind of like a sanctuary for creating music and so during the pandemic I went down I started building this house I designed it all on like a little square paper I even was look, looking yesterday I was looking at these old drawings from like this is how I designed my house just like on this little you know like this is the map of the house right and and uh and it took two years and and um and so then last year in April I went back to New York and I called Jake and I said hey Jake let's finish what we started Um, and I'm skipping steps. In the meantime, I had COVID. It was horrible. And I thought I was never going to be able to sing ever again. Because, And I just yeah. want to interrupt. I mean, I just want to say thank you for sharing the story behind it. Because um, I know, like you said, it's a very personal story. And it yeah. takes a lot of courage to share it. So thank you for sharing that. Um, of course. So I, I hook up with Jake and we finish the album. I have all these new songs. We record all the new songs. The old songs and the new songs fit together perfectly. I feel a huge weight off my shoulder. I feel so proud of myself for finishing something that I started. And right during that same time frame, I finished the house that I started building as well. That's amazing. And, and a few months later, a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, calls me and she's like, surreal. I was singing your song inside and out in the shower because I played it for her. And my mind was blown because the lyrics say, I will build a house so steady for you to come back to. I just need a little time. Mike, when I wrote this song five years ago, I had no clue I was going to build a house. Yeah, that's amazing. I remember you told that story when I got to see you perform uh, last month in Michigan. And it's just you, for me, what this taught story. me, I didn't even realize it. She had to point it out. Yeah. And what this taught me is that when you're creating, you should never judge what's coming out because it's not about you. It's coming from somewhere else. And you're just have, you just have to be open to receive the message and just be the messenger and, and provide this the story for someone else or maybe for you in five years you don't even right. know right and and so the way i see it now is 
this is my birth. This is the birth. The create the creation that had to happen was this house so that I could birth as a songwriter. And and that's what I want to do with these songs that are so personal is I want to empower women to be creators in many different ways. Yeah, no, that's amazing. What a journey that re the recording process has been. I mean, that's really amazing. And, and so the way the way we were recording, just to get more in specifics with Jake, was it was really just mostly him and me in the studio for hours looking for sounds, uh, figuring out the form of a song. So I would come in with a song and we would spend some time figuring out the form. I would teach it to him. He'd spend some time learning it on the keys. Then when we were ready with a, with a good, you know, strong form, I would put down the guitar or the uke. Then he would lay down the, the bass, which he freaking killed all throughout the album. Then he would put on the keys and we were like either in his living room or in his studio, which is called Keyboard Heaven. And so there was Rhodes and, and, and organ and the Moog and all kinds of different keys. Then I would sing the melody. And a lot of these songs, the melody is basically the scratch vocal. It's like the first time I sang it. Oh, it wow. Was very, yeah, very different than all the records I've ever done, which like the vocal is like the the core, the most important thing. No, this is like how the most natural way to sing the song, the first way you sing the song. And then I would scat. He would tell me, all right, all right now we're going to play the song and you, you just scat over the whole song. Just improvise, do your thing. And I would scat, improvise over the whole song. And then we would sit and listen. And he'd be like, oh, what you did there, that's a horn line. And what you did there, that's those are strings. And then we've got Wayne Tucker to come in. We got the horns to come in and to play what I scatted. So basically, I wrote the horn lines and all the little clarinet parts and whatever without knowing that I was writing them. What just a cool because way to come up with songs and arrangements. It's so cool. He's really, he's, he's a genius in that way because he really is taking the best out of the artist. So it really sounds like the artist. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that is so neat. Well, I want to ask you about a couple of the the um, other songs on the album because, you know, and, and if it's okay with you, I'd like to just play like little snippets in this uh, interview so people can just get a, a, a hint of what you're talking about. Um, yeah, when, when the record will be out though, not before. Okay, deal. <laughs> um, I love your version of For the, For the Love of You, the Isley Brothers song. What about, mm -hmm. you know, how did you decide to include that song? Uh, it was during the pandemic and this boy that I was quarantining with, uh, he really liked that song and he would play it and I kind of like got it in my head. Okay. And then I found myself just singing it, you know, like when a song is stuck in your head, except I was singing it with this bass line that was and it just so happened that he was a bass player so I was like hey can you play this bass line and so I started singing the song and that's how I wrote the arrangement and then when I came to Jake with it at first he was very um it was like very kind of septic he was like hmm okay I hear it okay and then it's like a light bulb went off in his head and he was like okay you know what I'm feeling for this, I'm feeling a Al Jarreau vibe from Breaking Away. I can hear that, yeah. Like really 80s. Yep. And so then he was into it. You know, you got to get Jake into the idea. You got to get Jake into the song. And then once he's into it, he's like, ideas <laughs> everywhere. influenced you artistically when making this album i mean i know that's a broad question but 
but um the 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 what i'm trying to say is just it's the the flow of the songs from song to song to song there's such a organic narrative through this album um so i'm just wondering yeah. how did you at, at what point do you say okay we have whether it's seven songs or ten songs because you did this over five years how do you mm -hmm. how does it become the album does that make sense <laughs> yeah well it's when you finish recording everything but right. um because the songs came one after the other you know it wasn't like okay we have all these songs let's do them uh but you know i've been inspired influenced by many many artists my whole life and new orleans also influenced me highly but i think all these songs and the reason why they sound so organic were influenced by the jungle you know it started with inside and out right with being there uh you know at a really heavy powerful moment and then just coming back to it coming back to the jungle because i felt this pull and and so a lot of these songs are really from the deepest part of me because that's what i can tap into when i'm over there and yeah they're either written in the jungle or influenced by the jungle or a result of my experience there and yeah that's what you know at the end of the album the very last song the outro is me it sounds of me walking around the jungle oh neat i'm glad you mentioned that yeah i wanted to put that in there because yeah because that's that's what that's what the place that gifted me this this music what initially brought you there when you were telling that story what what how did you decide to go to a jungle in costa rica so when I went to SUNY Purchase College, one of my best friends over there was a, a singer songwriter named Maria Cardona. And she's she's uh, she's Costa Rican. And um, after school, she moved back there. And so okay. I started visiting her every, you know, every year. But she was a city girl. She was living in the city and I would visit her and we would go do touristy things, you know, go to the volcanoes and whatever. And then one summer, she fell in love with Tarzan, literally, like Tarzan from the jungle. <laughs> and she moved to the jungle and I called her because I saw her the photos that she was posting. And I said, I'm coming. <laughs> and and I just fell in love with that, the land, the jungle. And so I started coming more and more and every winter spending more and more time with them. And that's why at some point I wanted to have my own land so that i can bring my own guests as well yeah. and share what they were sharing with me and and actually she's singing on the record she's the one the whatsapp message that she left one day i was feeling really low and she left me this whatsapp message singing Yo soy Dios a toda yeah okay that's her yeah that's her and that was wow. her giving me a message about you know to make me feel better this message this song says we are goddesses, we are powerful goddesses and are we are creators of everything. And and yeah, I just wanted to put that in the in the record because that's really the message of the whole the whole thing. Amazing. Oh, that is so cool. Um, I just have a few more questions. What uh, what does this look like when you perform it live? What's your ideal instrumentation to take this on the road? Yeah, wow. We just did that at Birdland. It was a test. I wanted to just, I'm not going to do these songs for until they're, they're out, you know, but uh, at Birdland, we had piano, bass, drums, guitar, trumpet, saxophone, and it was amazing. First <laughs> of all, it was the most incredible band. Um, and band? yeah, so it was Matisse Picard on the piano, Mikael Valianu on the guitar, Tamir Schmerling on the bass, Pedro Segundo on the drums, Wayne Tucker on trumpet, and Julian Lee on saxophone. And I've had I've had many times in my life where we come off the stage and we're like, wow, that was insane. But never this consistent. We did two shows a night for five nights. And after every show, we just looked at each other. Like after the first one, we were like, okay, this is going to be a, crazy week because it was really <laughs> special and yeah. everyone at birdland was telling us we've never felt this vibe at birdland ever 
Wow. There was so much love on the stage, so much love. So every we were so in the music, and it was so cool because it's my usual audience, you know, the, and it's Birdland audience, it's a jazz audience. But we were sing playing all these original songs, and stretching out on them, which is kind of my specialty. You know, I I I do Sondheim music, and it doesn't sound like Sondheim. It's it's just. Right it's improvised music is my my favorite thing and so we have these songs that have all this story in in it and all this personal you know it's a lot of people were say, saying after the shows they were like we felt like we were in your living room and you were just we were just catching up because it's my life i'm telling them through this song and so it's fe these very personal songs and we're just blowing and grooving and and just stretching out on them and it was really a special, very, very special week. Yeah, yeah. Well, Marie was there for one of the shows and she said it was just it, exactly as you've been describing it. She said it was just truly amazing. Oh, I'm glad she liked it. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay, so before we get to uh, the last few questions, so when when did looping become part of part of the, the set? It was a, a long time ago. I've been looping. I've been looping before looping was a vocal thing. One day I was a freshman in college and I went to have have lunch with a friend and there was a guitar player playing at the, you know, in the restaurant and he was by himself, but he was using this little machine with his feet where he could come for himself and then take a solo on top of himself. And I was like, that's what I want. <laughs> I just knew I wanted this before knowing it existed. And when I saw it, I immediately went and bought one and it was one that, you know, it was meant meant for guitar players. So you had to press with the feet. And so I started to, I started to, you know, cover songs that had, that had a looping bass line. Like I remember one of the very first ones I covered was Creedence Clearwater Revival, <laughs> uh, Fortunate Son. Okay. And then I, of course I covered Don't Worry, Be Happy. And yeah, and I did, I did that for my freshman, uh, for my sophomore recital and people went nuts. And so I, then I started, you know, playing around with it. And then because I didn't play an instrument, it was a really great way to write songs. And one of my most famous songs, one of the most covered songs on the internet that I ever wrote, I wrote on the looper. It's Nuit Blanche. And it's oh. a bass line. But, um, but yeah, so then I started writing a lot of songs on the looper and then taking it out on the road and doing a song on the looper. And then I got kind of sick of that because the fun part is creating the song. Then performing the song on the looper is, is not as fun as performing with humans, you know? Right. So then when I, so then I would, I started just improvising on the looper for a song, just being like, okay, for each show, I'll just do an improv and, you know, and just, jam out on the looper just like i do when i'm at home yeah and and that's been fun but at birdland i didn't use the looper because when you have a band of that caliber to me it's like a waste of a song to like have them sit down and play with a machine it's like it's something i'd like to do in my house yeah. and it became kind of like a, a thing because people are people are fascinated by it but I prefer, I have way more fun playing with humans. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. When I saw you perform last month and you did that, the audience loved it. And I understand, you know, it was a different band. It was a smaller band, so it made sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, cool. So is there anything else about the album we haven't covered that you want to mention um, just before we start to wrap up? Um, that I don't have a release date yet, but right. be on the lookout. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, that'll only build the the anticipation for people listening to this, because like I said at the beginning, it's really not it's it's a it's a really cool. I don't know what the right word is. It's just it's 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 unexpected, but it's like it's a, it's such a cool album and the tracks are so good. And I personally am really grateful that we had the chance to talk about it. So I learned more about the true story behind it and behind what went into it what you were going through, um, your persistence. I mean, five years, 
who who listening to this podcast has stuck out a project for five years i'm willing to bet nobody <laughs> that's amazing you should be really proud and i and i yeah. um i'm just so excited for the day to come when you are able to share it with everybody it's just an amazing album Me too. yeah well mm. congratulations on it and thank you for uh this conversation this was great thank you mike yeah this was, this was awesome you're a great interviewer well you're a great interviewee <laughs> Thank you.